right now, the way our society is structured, the way our politics are structured, the way everything's structured is it's profits over people. That money is the driver and not not humanity. And I feel like that's, that's something that we're starting to wrestle with and starting to see come out in our political dialogue. And I think that's something that we have to really face up to and deal with if we want to grow into this, you know, positive, empathetic, evidence-based, you know, society. <laughs> This is the Beware How Show, mystic philosophy made practical. There are many paths up the mountain, and we're just pointing at a few of them. I'm Bob Peck, speaking with Scott Stanley, Ryan Paget, and Melina Kiriaki. We are conscious creatives and formerly closeted mystics trying to unpack the inaccessible. According to the mystics, the truth cannot be spoken, but we'll try to talk about it anyway. Hello, this is Sunday, November 15th on the Beware How Show. Our guest today is Dr. Aaron Conrado. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me, y'all. Very glad to. Uh, I'm going to read through your bio and uh, we'll jump right in. Before I do that, just want to shout out to our collaborator, Ryan Paget. Um, he has worked very hard all year on HBO's Murder on Middle Beach. Um, it's a four part documentary series. It is premiering tonight. Um, by the time this episode airs, it will be, I think there'll be two episodes that you can watch on HBO. So. Uh, check it out. He is the head animator and graphic designer for an HBO show. So, cheers, Congrats, Ryan. Congrats, Ryan. Congrats, Thank you very much. Man. Yeah, yeah. Super exciting. Yeah, it's been uh, a long time coming. We've been working on this for, I mean, just me, have been working on this for almost a year now. Um, Madison, had, you know, he started shooting this uh, uh, eight years ago. Um, Jesus. It's also wow. his life so, story, so in some capacities, it's yeah. like he's, it's entire life. He's, he's tr- yeah. for a long time. He yeah, started exactly. this in film school at SCAD uh, back in like 2012, so he's wow. been working on it a really long time and uh, just really excited wow. to, for him to be able to share his story, and, and especially on such a large platform as HBO. Um, and it's gotten really, really amazing reviews so far. All the critics' reviews that came in on Friday all really really good stuff so really excited wow. for everyone to see it super cool i'm Great. gonna watch episode one tonight yeah me too <laughs> awesome Great. Um, Dr. Aaron Conrado, our guest today, holds a PhD in molecular biology from the University of Texas at Austin. While dedicating himself in graduate school to scientific progress for the betterment of others, he discovered a passion for communicating science to non-scientists and just like us, and decided to leave the halls of academia to pursue a career using this newfound talent to address societal problems by creating evidence-based policy solutions. Shortly after graduating, he left his home of Austin, Texas, and moved to Washington, D.C. to work on science policy in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the Executive Office of the President the White House. After taking a year off dedicated to more direct public service while crafting craft cocktails, he's now a science and technology policy fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, where he works in the executive branch, continuing his science policy journey. Aaron is currently a lecturer at the Archer Center in Washington, D.C. for a class called The Politics of National Memory. Killer bio. <laughs> Wow, my friend, <laughs> you make yeah. me sound a lot cooler than I am, Bob. I appreciate that. That's appreciate all this show that. is: is smoke and mirrors. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I we know have known you for a long time. So just to be totally clear, Aaron grew up with Scott and I in South Austin, and uh, he went off to OU um, after high school. And you're a rare Sooner Combo Longhorn, um, which might <laughs> yeah. be a beautiful dualistic uh, Yeah, uh, it's funny what happens when they give you a lot of money to go to college. You will put aside all preconceived notions <laughs> and go <laughs> to these places, yeah. Yeah, you will, so, yeah. and you did. But yeah, I mean, I, we want to talk a lot about your work as a policy fellow. Um, this is a spiritual show, so listeners... Um, 
don't worry, we'll cover science and spirituality um, and Aaron's thoughts and kind of uh, he's listened to some of these episodes and has and he knows us for a while. And so he has uh, thoughts that might uh, agree with some things that we have to say and some that might uh, create some friction, which I'm interested in covering as well. But um, but yeah, first, before we jump into that, give us a little more about your background, personal, professional. Yeah, thank you, Bob. A uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so as Bob mentioned, I grew up in Austin, Texas. We, I went to high school with Bob and Scott. Uh, like them, I was raised very Christian. I had a mother who was a Baptist and a father who was a Catholic, so I got both sides of the, the coin, yeah. which, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, led to a lot of questions from a very young <laughs> age because I'm getting kind of two stories of the same thing. Uh, I was also very passionate about science when I was a child, which was something that my parents cultivated. Uh, you know, I'd get want to know, learn more about the weather, and they'd buy me books on the weather. I'd want to learn more about space. They'd buy me books on space. want to learn more about dinosaurs. They'd buy me books on dinosaurs. So science was always a big passion of mine. And I think um, high school was kind of where both my scientific self and my spiritual self really blossomed. So on the science side, I had an amazing chemistry teacher who basically, I remember taking a test one time and he came and threw my test on my desk. We had a really good relationship. We were, he was very young. It was almost like we were friends and he was my teacher, but he threw my test down on my desk acting angry and was like, you need to get out of here. And I was like, what? And he's like, you need to go. And I was like, what did I, what did I do? And he's like, you need to go to college and go study this stuff because I'm trying to challenge you and I, I can't do it. Like you're wow. way beyond the scope you're of this gifted, class. Yeah. And he was like, and you you know, you can go do this as like a career. You can go be a scientist. You can ask these questions. And I was like, Oh wow. You know, I've been reading about it my whole life. I never thought about that. Um, so that kind of set me on the science trajectory. And then another thing that happened in high school was we had a class together, Bob, uh, with our good friend, Mr. Elderbrock, who I actually saw when I was just back in Austin. Uh, he lives mm -hmm. around the corner from my mom. So try and visit him uh, when I'm back in town. Cool. Beautiful. Um, but yeah, I think we all were kind of at a point where, of inquiry in our life. We were kind of questioning some of these things we'd been raised with, ways of thinking came to religion and spirituality. And um, yeah. you gave me a book called The Mystic Christ. <laughs> and I remember reading that book and just being like, wow, this is the Jesus I'm talking about. This is yeah. the guy who's like love and compassion it really felt it resonated with what i felt like that 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 the message that the good parts of the message that i took from from my upbringing and then that really kind of set me on a journey of exploring more and then i started like when i was in college i started looking into eastern philosophy i read the Tao Te ching uh read some other you know texts like that and just kind of started opening my mind and you know while i'm studying science i was also studying this so i've always kind of felt like a bridge between the two. And I know whenever, you know, we, after I graduated college, I came back to Austin, I was in graduate school, we used to have our, our think and drink sessions. So we'd get together, you know, once a month and Bob would bring together, you know, like the spiritual crowd and like the so hardcore science crowd. And I always felt like I was trying to be the person <laughs> in the middle that could take a little bit of each, kind of see each side, kind of try. And you were pretty the, the mediator -y. Bridge, The bridge points, yeah. yeah. Especially between, you know, when things would get heated. I'd like, I would oh, bring the Buddhists the and... I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. The scientists would have show like, up. And... We'd have like a Buddhist arguing with like a hardcore atheist materialist. And I'm like, guys, guys, yeah. guys, we're okay here. <laughs> <laughs> like the sharks um, and the jets dancing yes. in the alleyway. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Getting it going, yeah. Um, no matter is fundamental. Yeah. No consciousness is fundamental. Da, da, da. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So I kind of, you know, I feel like my my uh, going back to kind of the two journeys. So my scientific okay. journey since then is I finished graduate school. I realized in graduate school I did not want to stay in academia. I didn't feel like my calling was in research any further. But the reason I got into science um, more than just in, intellectual curiosity was I wanted to help people. Like the reason I went into biology and then went into infectious disease, like I was, I did biochemistry first and kind of went into microbiology, molecular biology, infectious disease. I always knew I wanted to help people. I wanted to do something that would have a tangible benefit and improve people's lives. You know, if I could develop a therapeutic, a vaccine, whatever. I knew that like I wasn't doing science just for, you know, 
the betterment of human knowledge, but also for the betterment of, you know, humankind of like the actual day to day lives of people. Um, and I never lost sight of that. Which even I when I was like, I <laughs> thank you, thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never lost sight of that. Even mm-hmm. when I was like, I don't want to do research anymore. I was like, okay, well then, ha- as you said in my bio, I started to do science communication a lot. I'd go talk to kids at schools. I'd go talk to museums i'd go work at science summer camps just trying to break down you know all this complex scientific knowledge that i had and and give it to people in a manner that they can understand because i always tell people like what i do is not beyond anyone's comprehension anyone can understand it i just when we talk about it in professionally we (laughs) use terms we use things that you know are common to us You're translating to the layman right Right. And I always say, if you can't break your science down and explain it, you know, I use the mom test. If I can't explain it to my mom and my mom can't have a general idea of what I'm doing, I don't think I really know what I'm doing. So Mm -hmm. um, that's great. So anyway, so I I saw this passion, uh, this new passion and wanted to pursue that. And so I ended up stumbling into the world of science policy, which I didn't even totally recognize was a thing at first. Um, so I secured a fellowship here in DC, just kind of over the summer, uh, three to four month thing and thought I'd come try it out. Uh, there was an, uh, internship component of that. So I managed to get an internship in the white house at the office of science and technology policy. Um, don't ask me how I did that. I just filled out some <laughs> forms and they called me and said, sure, come on. So, you know, I was working next door to the white house every day. Um, it's pretty surreal. I saw Kanye West when he walked into the White House. Like, wow. at least didn't you see in the news, you know, like they're happening. It was weird. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I ended up staying on. So I was there for about six months. And then there was another fellowship here in D.C. that the one that I'm currently doing that I wanted to apply for. Uh, but there was about a year in between. So I was like, yeah, you know, I'll go work service industry. I've done that before. Uh, ended up becoming a bartender, learning how to make cocktails, which was a lot of fun. Met a lot of great friends doing that. And then, yeah, started this fellowship um, started this fellowship after that. And then my spiritual growth kind of since grad school, I feel like it, it's, it's like punctuated equilibrium. Like I will like immerse myself in it and like read a lot of books and like, like find this kind of new plateau where I feel and, and, and think, and then like, I'll get sucked into something else and I'll kind of set it aside for a little while. And then it kind of percolates in the background for like maybe six months to a year. And then all of a sudden it's like, Whoa, I'm back. Let's go. Um, and so like recently uh in the past year or so i've like started a meditation practice which has been great nice. uh i've started reading i was like i was telling bob i even started reading the books that i've had on my to read list like autobiography of a yogi i yeah. find, like i was listening to one of your episodes the episode about it and y'all were talking and i was like all right i gotta crack this thing open it's time <laughs> i gotta start reading this i gotta get there so I've been I told Aaron that. if the only re- the only thing that comes out of this podcast is that Aaron Conrado, Doctor Conrado, reads Autobiography of a Yogi <laughs> and influences policy decisions scientifically, then our work is done. <laughs> Job done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. So so that's been great. And then uh, and then yeah now so I work in the executive branch as a AAAS uh, fellow. I'm actually at the Department of Defense of all places. And like disclaimer, everything I say on this podcast is not reflective of AAAS or the Department of Defense. It's my personal views. Don't at the Secretary of Defense. Or anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I work on peacekeeping of all things, which was something I, you know, not what you think when you think of the Pentagon and something when I saw the listing, because for this fellowship, you interview all across the government. I interviewed at National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, Department of State, all different places. But I saw us listed and I was like, peacekeeping? The Department of Defense? I got to go check this out. I'm, I'm intrigued. <laughs> um, I had a great interview with my supervisor, who's a great guy. Uh, it's been a really interesting office. It's been really interesting to see kind of how, you know, the largest government agency, the behemoth that kind of has its fingers in every pie, uh, operates from the inside. And then also kind of how, you know, this little small slice that's like, hey, let's slow war down let's try and prevent war how that kind of fits into the the thought making and decision making processes there wow that's amazing so great that's there's so much that i want to dive into at each turn of the (laughs) narrative here at your Um, disposal well thank you thanks so much for that context too um 
we also had a laugh that that means that I gave you the Mystic Christ 15 years ago, <laughs> uh, which means yes. that I've just been basically giving that book out to people. I think I gave it out to someone, someone like a month ago. Yeah. Oh, we're we're just, passing that crucial inflection that's point. What I'm you and doing. I, and we, uh, I see it with a lot of other friends too, where we've known each other now longer than we haven't. Yes. Which is <laughs> yeah. mind blowing to think about. Yeah, uh, that's we're cool. old. But yeah, no, that that's beautiful that you uh, referenced that book because it, it so transformed me and my spiritual path and Scott and his and Ryan and his eventually as well. And like, you know, I, I just love so many little moves in your story, not little, like gigantic actually uh, turns in your, in, your, in your plot points that you laid out here. Um, one thing that I'd love for you to talk about too before we get into the policy and the Department of Defense and peacekeeping, which I really want to ask you more about. Um, but you, from from my understanding about your studies, you were initially into um, bacterial um, phenomenon, right? Yeah. Um, and, and basically what you told me years ago was that you were trying to help curb um, antibiotics being less successful. Yeah. Yeah, so that was kind of what my my graduate work centered around. Um, the therapeutic applications would be quite a ways down the road, but we were kind of at the base level trying to find knowledge that we could then use to get there. Um, but one of the reasons because antibiotics... Because they develop immunities, right? Yeah, you're going to get right. all the... Yeah. Right, so bacteria are... They develop resistance. Basically what happens is when you mutate or when you stress a bacterial cell it starts randomly mutating its DNA everywhere, non-discriminately, in the hopes that it will pick up a mutation in the, in the right spot that will then make it able to better survive the stress. It's almost like a population-based strategy, right? Because you think about there's these populations of, in the body or in the environment of thousands, maybe millions, maybe, probably not billions. That's more of like laboratory conditions of cells. So it's almost like they all just start mutating themselves and most of them you know like kill themselves they hit a gene that's essential they die but it's like if one of us can survive and pick up that one mutation mm -hmm. then i will survive and if i'm surviving i'm not stressed i can start growing again and then one cell becomes two becomes four becomes eight becomes 16 like you know and then all of a sudden whoop, we're rocking and rolling and we're all resistant it's like all of my brothers and sisters shall live on through me it's it's so <laughs> it's such a weird thing to think of it's right natural um, selection exactly all of that right? um <clears throat> exactly and and then the next step to that is this bacteria that's developed a resistance can encounter another bacteria usually the same species but it can even be different species and pass that resistance to them it'd be wow. like if i you know shook your hand and said bob now you have all of my science knowledge and my eye color and my hair color i could pass traits to you just through like contact obviously we cannot do that but bacteria can and so then you have this new organism it's never seen this antibiotic before has no reason it should be resistant to it but it is and then if and when it encounters an antibiotic it's like eh, whatever I'm, I'm i'm good i don't <laughs> you're not bothering me and so obviously that becomes a problem because this is happening all the time it's happening at increased rates due to things like improper use of antibiotics. Um, and then at the same time, we aren't really making a lot of new antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And so there's fears that, you know, within a matter of decades, there's going to be certain pathogens, certain diseases. You go to the doctor and you say, hey, I've got this. And the doctor says, eh, good luck, man. Like, we'll do what we can, but we don't really mm -hmm. have a medicine for this. Like, we could go back to a pre-antibiotic era. Wow. So that's like super that's scary. That's scary, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and like right now we're going through, you know, like a pandemic. I feel like those are like the, those are like the short acute problems that we could face when it comes to infectious disease. The long term problems are things like this, like antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm. So, when we talk about you know antibiotic resistance getting transferred from one bacterium to another, that was the kind of thing that I studied how can this organism take up it, it's carried on genetic information on dna on genes how can this bacteria take up a piece of dna that it's never seen before that it should know what to do with and work it into the systems that already exist in that cell and then use it because bacteria are really frugal when it comes to energy 
because they're very vulnerable to their environments. They're very, they don't know where the next piece of food's going to come from, right? Like our cells waste energy all the time. They're just burning it off. They're, they're fine because they're all working together. You know, they, one bacteria cell and it's lonesome. It's just like, I, if I find a little scrap of food, I have to get the most out of it. I do everything I can mm. with it. So it's all these really tightly regulated systems for when certain genes come on, when certain genes come off, because it doesn't want to waste anything. Like so it's a like, desert how can these plant like, or something, like a succulent. Yeah. With no yeah. resources. <laughs> it's just, it has to go the furthest it can with what yeah. it's got. It doesn't want to waste anything. So how can, how can this new piece of information integrate so easily into these really tightly regulated systems and then you know for the organism's benefit so that was the kind of thing that i studied with the idea being that hope if we could understand these mechanisms maybe we could stop that from happening in the first place maybe you can say hey we can create some kind of therapeutic where you can't take up this dna or maybe you can still take it up but you're not going to be able to use it or maybe as soon as you take it up you kick it right back out that would be the idea I remember you first explaining that to me, I think, at a Think and Drink philosophy night at Hole in the Wall. And yeah. uh, I remember thinking, like, I'm doing important work with my films and religious <laughs> whatever exploration. And then Ryan, or, uh, Aaron was literally like, yeah, I'm trying to curb humanity's potential at avoiding a super bug that destroys civilization. <laughs> That's what I'm working on. <laughs> you know, he didn't say it like that, but that was my read. I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> One of the things about scientists I'm going to go Bob back into that... Adobe Premiere. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things about scientists is every scientist thinks that their work is the most important thing in the world. <laughs> uh, if they weren't, then they wouldn't be doing it. That's true. And they also get really good at telling stories about it because they have to write grants. They have to convince people to fund them. So they have to convince you why Self this is so important, yeah. why it's the why it's the most important thing you should fund over everything else. So we get good at like kind of spinning up our own research, you know. If you were with me That's in important. lab watching me do it, you'd probably be like, This is boring. Yeah, you're yeah. just like taking a tray out of a fridge. And then I'm putting just like a tray pipetting. Into a fridge I'm moving yeah. small <laughs> amounts of liquid from one place to another place, and then you have some of this liquid that tell me this liquid is not the same liquid you had before. Yeah, I love it. Man. That's so great. Hey, I was curious. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard that um, that the vast majority of antibiotics that we use are for like our food supply, like they get, like for animals, um, or is that? I've just heard that. Yes. I don't know. No, there's a lot that goes into food supply to prevent animals from getting sick. And then they end up in your food. And so then they end yeah. up in your body in low levels. And that can then cause resistance. Like that's one of the main mm -hmm. ways resistance grows is that if you're exposing them to antibiotics at a low level, it's not enough to really kill them, but it's enough yeah. to stress it's them like out. Like a vaccine. So they, they're going to try and adapt. Mm -hmm. So then you're not getting this phenomenon where, you know, a million cells dies, but one survive. It's like a million cells get stressed and then they're all trying to figure it out. Mm. So one of them can more easily figure it out. Yeah. Right. Are you optimistic about the amount of like initiatives and worldwide researchers and making advancements in that field? Uh, Cause you, you switched uh, no. initiatives a bit. <laughs> no, uh, I wish I was. Yeah, I think ca it's cancer a gets a lot of attention right now, which yeah. I mean, it should. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the, you know, everyone gets affected by cancer. My father passed away from cancer last year. My aunt passed away from cancer mm -hmm. the year before. Uh, it affects everybody and it's much more visible, I feel like, because antibiotic mm -hmm. resistance hasn't quite reached that tipping point yet. Yeah. Uh, and I saw We're it. We're bad at long term stuff, too, by the way. I mean. Right. Just We're bad at recognizing problems and, yeah. until they blow up in our face. See climate change Correct. Um, and a million other yeah. examples. But yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that there is starting to be some shifts. Like there was a big report that came out of the UK a few years ago that said by 2050, antibiotic resistance will be the number one killer of humanity on the planet. And it will hmm. also have the biggest health cost on wow. the or cost burden on the healthcare system mm -hmm. so if people pay attention to that then maybe we can turn it around but um yeah i think eventually we can get to a place where we turn it around but i think there will be a period where things get bad for a while we need researchers yeah. it's just human mm -hmm. nature uh, well and, human you nature. know it feels it feels like we're we can't avoid the fact that there's a global pandemic <laughs> right now and there was a 
vaccine. Yeah. Allegedly, that was, you know, past 90% effectiveness and so on. So, I mean, I, I'm actually, there's a, a clinical trial for um, uh, my body has a, a very mild form of muscular dystrophy. And so I think you guys know that, mm. but um, mm. I was going to be in a clinical trial for uh, reducing the potential of, uh, of the disease. And uh, it was like going really well. And then it just shifted priority wise. Like it's probably going to be later next year that the yeah. next phase is available. Is this because COVID? Because everyone's yeah. trying to, you know, all the research swings in certain directions. You know? Yeah, well, very tunnel vision right that. now. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. I'm hoping that the fact that, you know, we are all, our lives have all been drastically changed due to an infectious disease will then in the future kind of put more emphasis on, hey, we need to be studying these things. Yeah. We need to be working with these things. Hopefully that's one oh. of the shifts that co comes from this whole global experience is being a little more preventative and, and self-aware. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Yeah. I'm curious if you think, um, I guess, I'm, you know, as with everyone, like the pandemic is on my mind, especially as numbers are like spiking right now. Do you think that like the antibiotic resistance would, will also, that will also be kind of like a, you know, if it does become on strong, like creates a situation where we need to lock down again, where like staying separated is the best way to prevent it or is that a whole different situation than, than a viral pandemic? I'm glad you asked that because when we talk about antibiotics, <laughs> uh, we're talking about bacteria. Yeah. So antibiotics, we don't really, we have some antiviral therapies, but those are very novel. Antibiotics are by and large bacterially targeted yeah. and bacteria are the ones that are developing resistance. Um, it's actually interesting that you say that though, because so, so antibiotic resistance doesn't really apply to viruses, right. but it's interesting you say that because for every single living organism we've ever found, we've also found a virus that infects it, which includes bacteria. Mm. And they're, they think that the main way these genes get transferred, these antibiotic resistance genes get transferred between bacteria isn't even the way I described earlier, the contact. It's that a virus infects a bacterial cell and kind of inserts itself into the bacteria's genome while it's replicating and stuff. And then when it jumps back out, it kind of pulls extra genes with it, which can include antibiotic mm. resistance genes. And then wow. it infects the next cell and it leaves them behind, which is mm. interesting. Um, so as far as COVID wise, I don't think that would be a thing, but that is a, another cool yeah. another cool phenomenon wow. that we see in nature. So One thing that's particularly interesting to me about you know, you having a PhD and you being such an expert in your field regarding just scientific research and, you know, even just knowing the fundamentals about uh, this area of knowledge so thoroughly that, you know, it seems like in 2020 and, you know, the age of information and the age of disinformation, like the amount of misconceptions that you must see uh, must be frustrating. And, you know, I think to, to tie it thematically to Beware How Show is like, you know, a lot of what we talk about is like, like deprogramming or unlearning or, you know, that's those are strong verbs. But, you know, yeah. there, there's a there's a lot of misconceptions that our culture uh, pervades our collective understanding. And I feel like you know, science is uh, certainly a part of that and that there's just so much because of all the content, because of all the information about these areas of study, um, you know, there, there's more eyes and more impressions on like hyperbolic claims and, uh, you know, ungrounded stuff. Whereas like scientific research journals, for example, are pretty slept on. Like there's not, it's mostly yeah. just scientists that are working in those areas. And like, how do we um, you know, get that, get grounded information out in a way that is more reliable and trustworthy and allows to empower people. Unlike the lies. I don't know. You know what I mean? Y'all hear me. I, I, I do. And I think that, you know, the democratization of information in so many ways is a double edged sword. Yeah. Like you can kind of just find a source that supports your viewpoint and go with that and that's not i mean we're all guilty of it not even in a scientific sense just in a personal sense or a political sense or whatever sense you know like i saw one time i think it was um 
I think it was Al Roker. You know the media, the way the media portrays science. They're like, a study says this, which doesn't right. mean that's true. It's one study, right? You need an aggregation of a lot of studies. You need a mountain of evidence to start. To prove and it. there's confirmation bias from the researchers themselves if they're interested Absolutely. in the field that they work Absolutely. towards. Absolutely. Yeah. people's careers are at stake and when we talk yeah. about you know what we might talk about later talking about yeah. you know <laughs> is consciousness derived from the brain or not <laughs> right there are people mm -hmm. whose whole careers are staked on that that if we say consciousness is something separate from the brain everything they've done the past 30 years doesn't really mean as much anymore yeah so, there's politics involved mm, yeah right but yeah but I, I believe it was al roker and i don't fault him for this you know he's on TV. <clears throat> but they were talking about some study of like says that you know coffee is good for you or coffee is bad for you whatever and he mm -hmm. said you know you see all these studies that say conflicting things i feel like you just you know pick the ones that you want and then go on with your life like that and i was just like no like, <laughs> so like, that's not how this works um, <laughs> Just, yeah, just I, Al I, Roker spitballing to 10 million yeah, people. Yeah, right. And I'm like, I understand. <laughs> you know, he's on TV. He's just doing his thing. He's being funny. But I'm like, no, that has cool. It's Gavin. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think to go back to your, your original question, I think um, something that scientists, a place where they fail, and it's funny because research supports that this is a this does not work. You can't just beat people over the head with data. You can't just make yeah. people more scientifically literate and understand and expect people to change their minds, expect society to shift and change. It just, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Uh, telling people they're wrong is probably the best way to, to get them to keep believing whatever they believe. Yeah. You said it. So I think science has an issue where we need to tell better stories. Stories stick in people's minds more than data. And I mean, that's we have data to support this, right? Yeah, and I have data to support, it. <laughs> and that's my story. Um, I mean, this has played out over thousands of years, right? Throughout human history, like before we wrote things down, we told stories. That was what our history was enshrined in. You know, the the story is something central to the human experience, and so I feel like when you can take your data, take the things you know, and couch it in a good story that people are more likely to buy into it. And I feel like you also have to approach people where they are. You know, when you talk to someone who's a climate denier or who thinks the earth is flat, instead of just being like, you're an idiot, go away. Uh, you have to be like, really? You have to just like kind of probe. Like, why do you think yeah. that? Oh, well, what, what's your evidence for? Oh, well, it brings you to believe that. Oh, that's interesting because I've heard this. And when you kind of just like, just poke, sometimes you can find little holes that you can poke at and prod at and just kind of plant the seed because they have to get there themselves, right? You, it's, it's like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, right? You can lead mm -hmm. them there and kind of give them, oh, well, you should check this out. Oh, maybe you should look at this. Um, but you can't just, yeah, just sledgehammer people into trying to believe something. It's never going to work. Yeah, which is yes. what our political culture does. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, well, and I think it reminds me of um, a lot of the, <clears throat> work I've been doing, which is, uh, I mean, one thing about just when it comes to like expressing yourself or sharing your feelings with someone who may have like done something to harm you or make you, f you know, feel bad. Um, it's really important not to make them wrong, not to tell them like you did this wrong. I'm just, it's not that I'm just expressing how I'm feeling and your, and your actions. This is how it made me feel, you know? So I think it's really important. It reminds me of that. It's like, you know, telling people that they're not that they're wrong, but just a perspective shift. You know, and I, and I feel like the storytelling really is uh, is a matter of that. It's a perspective shift. Like, how do we paint a picture from a different perspective to create empathy? Um, that's when I feel like things really change, you know, being able to create empathy um, for the perspective on the other side of whatever you might be thinking. And um, I think that's great. I think like, you know, scientists learning how to, you know, be better storytellers uh, would, would, help, would help a lot for sure. And be Absolutely. empathetic listeners, and uh, yeah, your yeah. your level of like <laughs> spiritual maturity and self awareness is extremely refreshing. Being that your work office is next door to the White House, so please continue mm -hmm. to uh, <laughs> spread this these totally. types of techniques of like empathy and like you know 
uh, yeah. listening, mindful listening, you know, is what you're talking about. I think mm-hmm. we see that across our culture in all aspects. What we need is more empathy and we need yeah. to be teaching people to be more empathetic. Like I think the four of us have become empathetic people through different means. I think we were all probably started with some semblance of empathy that we then cultivated and grew and had good people around us, good experiences to help grow it. But not everybody has that opportunity. Not everybody is raised that way. And some people are, right. yeah. some people aren't even pushed to be that way. Right. Um, I mean, I think we see it in our society, you know, like I always say, Right now, the way our society is structured, the way our politics are structured, the way everything's structured is it's profits over people, that money is the driver and not not humanity. And I feel like that's, that's something that we're starting to wrestle with and starting to see come out in our political dialogue. And I think that's something that we have to really face up to and deal with if we want to grow into this, you know, positive, empathetic evidence-based you know society <laughs> that that mm-hmm. we would like to see the, that a lot of people would like to see the world be mm. beautifully said yeah yeah everyone's really interested in um winning arguments <laughs> that's the <laughs> right that's what everyone wants to do on 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 uh you know twitter or wherever it's like that's that's so the you golden go you know like here's yeah. you know and and to your point you know, even if someone is absolutely right and they're coming from like evidence-based, you know, background and they're like, look, look at this data, look at this ledger, this means you are wrong. That's not going to work. It's not going to change their mind. It's not going to help. It's going to make them mad. It's going to make you mad. It's just, it's, it's, it's hard to admit it, but it's like that will usually not convince someone or change people's hearts and minds. <laughs> but it'll get yeah, you there's... likes. It'll get you retweets. <laughs> <laughs> there's a line from A Course in Miracles that says, would you rather be right or happy? <laughs> yeah i think that's a mm. tough lesson to learn too and ryan touched yeah, on this too tough. you know especially when you're talking to someone that you know you're having you're having beef with or confrontation or someone that's wrong to you like you can't make it about i'm right you're wrong you messed me up so this is my retribution on you like yeah. you have to find that wellspring of love and empathy and forgiveness and yeah otherwise it's just gonna you're just going to tear the chasm wider. I think it's, yeah, and um, the key part to that too is like the willingness to want to lean in and to become closer, not to pull away and to separate. And that's like the key difference um, in that. When, you know, when you make someone wrong, it is causing separation between the two of you. Um, but mm-hmm. when you just express how you're feeling, uh, not in efforts to make them wrong, but to want to be closer, um, to, mm-hmm. to, to get through this thing, um, that's right. like a key key difference, you know, and I I feel like that that little key right there is like is what is missing in a lot of the political yeah. differences is like there's not a willingness at all to want to lean in and to become closer and more unified. It's just a want to pull away and to separate. And I think a lot of that comes from language at the top. You know, that's just kind of plain and simple. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's fear based. Yeah, I mean, how, yeah. Aaron, how do you see this translating when you're, in, you know, segueing into your role within like peacekeeping from a scientific perspective within the Department of Defense? Like, are, how, like, give us some environmental cultural flavor here of like what those departments, I mean, are you like the hippiest tree hugger? in dc like how, how rare are you i i might have been until recently when i cut all my hair off yeah i know i was gonna uh, say i went back into the office here today the first time for cutting my hair off and of course all the military guys were like i love it it looks great and i'm gonna keep telling you <laughs> to reinforce oh, yeah, this behavior because it looks good. So good i also yeah, I like I just off, the eight, military guy saying i love your hair yeah, I love that too. <laughs> 18 inches of, love of hair man wow yeah yeah, yeah you were um, amazing yeah you looked but christ-like i i i think our yeah, science jesus is what people would always say. <laughs> um yeah I, I i think our office uh people there understand this is something that we then can try to convey to leadership and try and get worked into things is that like you know the best war is the one that's never fought hmm. that if we so we we work a lot through the un um do their peacekeeping missions and a lot of african nations mostly there's a few others but africa is the main focus 
Uh, and the point of the UN putting those peacekeeping missions there is to try and create a stable situation where then a government can form and can hold successive elections and build people's faith in the government. Because a lot of people in these places, you know, a government comes up, uh, it might be corrupt. Oftentimes it is corrupt and it takes advantage of the people. It has fake elections and so they have no faith in it. And then eventually it falls. And then a new one props up and we don't want this cycle to propagate for forever right we want there to be stability we want these people to be able to have a government that they can trust and have faith in and try and have some sort of stability in their lives especially because you know they're already living in very tough conditions there's a lot of the poorest countries in the world or least developed countries in the world by many metrics um so you know at the department of defense which is an agency that is geared towards national security toward protecting american interests towards uh you know competing with the other global powers like russia and china so we have to kind of couch it in that language of you know these by like these are spaces where our competitors are competing and if we're not competing there then we're falling behind but i i think in our office mm -hmm. you know and i don't want to speak again these are just my personal viewpoints and i don't want to speak for the, my my coworkers. but the sense i get from them is that like we all see the value in this. Like a lot of my coworkers are either current or former military. They've seen war. They've seen what it's like. And they, they all agree that like, if we can never fight another war again, that would be great. If we can prevent war from breaking out, that is much better than having to put, you know, uh, our lives on the line, put American lives on the line or anybody's lives on the line um, mm -hmm. to fight a larger refreshing. conflict. And then, of course, you know, under certain administrations, you got to put it in dollar terms. It's like, well, we save money. And sometimes that flies. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah. yeah so and not to be too um, the other direction, but like when, you know, the term, the military industrial complex, right? Like there, there are gun makers and, you know, weapons manufacturers that influence politicians and they, that, can lobby into decisions into getting into conflict and so there is a profit you know back to your point earlier there is a profit aspect to it absolutely i mean you have think tanks here in washington dc that are funded by companies that make weapons and they put out a report yeah. that says oh there's a gap between the u.s and russia on x capability or x weapon you know we we need to make more of those and then you know the department of defense reads that and says oh my gosh right we are falling behind we need to make those yeah uh so then they sign a contract to that company to make them well that company that funds that think tank are the people who make those and so yeah may we shift some, away uh, from those and into the former vets yeah. that want to avoid there, war. there can be some <laughs> some some slippery kind of stuff going on yeah mm -hmm. mm. yeah thankfully that's not in my wheelhouse i don't have to do <laughs> with that stuff you did go to africa I, I, i'm glad you mentioned that because tell I did. us more about that uh, trip if you would uh this is a very very eye-opening experience so yeah, yeah i was mostly in the central african republic and the democratic republic of the congo with a little bit of time in rwanda uh yeah and i was in areas like i said that are very uh underdeveloped very poor very conflict ridden uh yeah and it was very eye-opening you know it makes you I'm already very grateful and very thankful for the things that I have, but seeing it like that, you really, you really feel it. You really feel yeah. it. Um, some beautiful places though, beautiful places, but, but yeah, I mean, you're staring poverty right in its face and it, it's hard, you know, there's, you're, you're there and there, there's so much you want to do to help these people. There's, there's so much you wish you could do to help these people, but there's, you, you only have, so much that you can actually do was this um, a research trip so this was for work yeah this was through work to go visit the the un peacekeeping missions that are in those two countries okay um so and yeah they're doing mediation was, between conflicting groups primarily or like what, yeah so a lot of, of it is yeah. like trying to enforce the peace agreement between the government and different armed groups trying to like uh disarm and demobilize these armed groups and then reintegrate mm -hmm. them. A lot of times they'll try and say like, Hey, you know, throw down your weapons, like renounce this group. And then we will retrain you and make you a soldier in this country's army. And then through that, you know, you have a job, you can get paid. Um, Cause I mean, th th that's the thing that you see in all these places is people, 
I, I'm in Africa. <clears throat> I've traveled other places in the world. I'm sure y'all have too. And everywhere I've gone, I see the same thing. Every single person wants the same. They want, you know, food, water, shelter. They want to love and be loved. Uh, they want security. Yeah. Support you know, their they want family. Autonomy, like, have a family. Right. Everybody wants the same you know basic needs and i think that you know ultimately that would be the goal that's the goal over there that's the goal of what we're trying to do here you know in our country that's the goal anywhere is just to try and secure these things ideally um and maximize happiness for the most amount of people easier said than done but yeah yeah <laughs> that's what easier said than done. <laughs> yeah but no but maybe it doesn't mean we stop trying right? work towards it yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's like that's ancient. Great. That's like Upanishadic type of type of vibe. Yeah, man. may all beings yeah. be happy. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm hesitant to steer into matter versus consciousness is fundamental because I feel like we're gonna get the runaround, frankly, uh, or that we're gonna get just encircled by a genius <laughs> and i wouldn't i, I almost want to claim to my i want to cling to my fanaticism um <laughs> and uh, i'm afraid i'm I mean, gonna get disproven there's plenty of other stuff i can talk about too <laughs> if, you, if you want me to, if you want me to retain my uh i'm not i'm not beliefs. here to just like bash you down until you know i <laughs> i know you're not but you're um you're you know you're a scientific researcher phd tell us tell hey, us about I, I some of those it. Yeah. pieces yeah <laughs> yeah yeah let's do it let's do it uh i have a couple of quotes i can read i this one's maybe a fun one to jump us in um okay the uh the idea that science progresses by a series of funerals yeah um yeah. <laughs> in that we're always expanding i mean i think that's part of the the big piece in in the consciousness is fundamental crowd is like you know scientific materialism really stems from the 1700s from um you know newtonian um to you know, you know the earlier enlightenment era physics whereas the shift towards consciousness is fundamental does bring in the quantum physicists and and the new leaps in understanding about reality and so um you know that idea that there's a there's a resistance like you said the plateaus like there's a resistance before the jump there's a resistance before the jump uh in all yeah. these advances within the field of science and uh it feels it feels like we're in one you know and within this space yeah I, I think we are in a lot of different senses i think as science has expanded and expanded and expanded you come up against these more and more often but i feel like this is an interesting one that is really like overarching a lot of things like yeah. you know everybody talks about like the grand question in science is trying to find a unified field theory, right? Trying to explain mm -hmm. how all these different forces and their different things we we experience interact and how they work. And, you know, saying that consciousness is fundamental over matter is one that answers that question. So yeah, it's a big it's a big leap, it's a big shift. As I was thinking about this, I was like, I think the three of you have already like jumped off the cliff and are like swimming in the sea of consciousness. And I'm just <laughs> years like, ago. I'm just, I'm right, and I'm at like the edge of the cliff, looking over, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, should I? I don't know. Should I? Uh, and we're just but, like, um, I like how it's the images we're falling down a cliff, though. Like it's like to our. <laughs> but you're you're diving off the cliff and you're landing in the cool water. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Like, oh, God, come on, come it's on. I just so like rocky. I like it. Yeah, it's a descent into. Yeah the end of our lives um, <laughs> <laughs> um no the yeah, water's I, just I mean, fine brother <laughs> yeah so just from a but like, <clears throat> i don't think that it's i don't think it's like completely ab absurd to say that i mean i i think that the some of the arguments that are offered make sense and I, I think you know you can see from a lot of people that understand things on the quantum level much better like i am not a physicist by any stretch of the imagination right. um you see a lot of these people that start to sort of embrace this idea as well which you know makes you kind of hmm, like talking about like max max planck's the one that gets quoted a lot um yeah mm -hmm. i think the one thing that that bothers me when i see uh spiritual people talk about science is just like 
if you want to talk about science and you aren't a scientist, like, but you want to talk about it with authority, make sure you know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. You got to make here, sure. Here. Like, when I hear <laughs> atoms are mostly empty space, like, that's not true. That's And, and to their credit, that's often what I'll we teach people. I'll own dropping that one. That's yeah. often what we teach people in school. Because, mm. And, I mean, even in college, even in undergrad, you learn yeah, things in science classes. Yeah, we've heard that a lot in school. Yeah, yeah you, you learn things in science classes that are a watered-down version of what it really is because they don't think yeah. that you're able to handle what it really is, that you can wrap your mind around it, which mm. I think is dumb because then you ingrain these false ideas. Yeah, you know? right, right. So, so the, the picture we end up with in our head of an atom is that it's all particles, right? That it's a bundle of particles in the middle with other particles going around the outside. So there's all this empty space between the particles. But really they're acting like waves things act like particles at high energy like when we slam them into each other in a collider they act like particles and we want them to act like particles so we can smash them apart and see what they're made out of but at a low energy state like what they're like in your atoms they act like waves which means that like this is hard for us to comprehend because the world around us is more or less like particles right like discrete like so they occupy a lot of space at once. I don't know. I have a really good article I can send you that, that can talk about this better than I can. But Sure. Um, we'll link it. The idea yeah. that it's they almost like it there's a cloud. A cloud. Right. right. Yeah. There's like a cloud. And you can think of that cloud as like, if you want to think of that as occupied space. Right. So, so every time I, like I listen to something like, well, you know, our atoms are mostly empty space. And then I use that to make some kind of argument about consciousness. And like, that's your yeah, foundation is not good our, dog. Our old buddy yeah. Sam. I mean, I, we we have a very secular physics-minded pal, and um, he Sam. he told me that yeah years ago, which really did uh, you know leave an effect because I, I think I think it's true. I think you know I always try to preface my uh, anytime I talk about this stuff by saying, "Hey, I'm not a scientist." You know, like disclaimer kind of thing, which I think is super important because I mean, he told me that years ago, uh, making the argument that. A lot, a lot of spiritual teachers will say like, well, quantum physics proves this aspect. And it's like, it, what you're doing is you're taking the life's work of someone in order to misread it and make your argument flimsy, you know, like take your flimsy argument yeah. about reality and make it mm-hmm. firmer without really knowing it or really honoring what they've did and what research yeah. that you're kind of co-opting. So. I think that is extremely important to talk about, you know, as far as like within spirituality and science is that, um, you know, let's really be sure that we're, um, you know, not not doing that, that we're not misreading what what these uh, these results, you know, scientific papers and studies and so on. I mean, I think it's. When, when you talk about the specifics is key whereas if you just say like well quantum physics proves spirituality then that's not quite right so let's really right be clear a wise person once said if you come at the king you better not miss hi right now science is the king of the way we think so you got to be careful yeah if you're gonna yeah yeah you got to have yeah. really strong evidence if you're gonna make like a really bold claim and then or it needs to back up yeah or at least not yeah speak incorrectly or spuriously because then that's really easy for people to lock in on and not listen to the rest of what you're saying and saying oh but that's wrong but that's wrong but that's wrong Mm -hmm. and i feel like you know when we talk about so i haven't read um an end to upside down thinking yet but i've watched some interviews with the author and that's one of the things he talks about you know when they talk about have you gotten pushback from people it's like well they harp in on specific examples instead of looking at the aggregate right Mm -hmm. uh which my Responses and all right, well then just drop those examples. If your argument still holds without those examples, just drop those ones. The ones, mm-hmm. the low hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. To, but, yeah, uh, and there's well, and there's conflicting. There, there's scientists that <clears throat> are so pro and so against. And so I think maybe it'll be useful to define what the hell we're talking about if anyone's lost here. But basically, what we're talking about is how. And you know, I have it's called an end upside down thinking. There's a there's a variety of books on this subject but basically the quote is whether you realize it or not most of modern society's thinking is based upon a philosophy known as materialism or scientific materialism that's the notion that physical material known as matter is fundamental in the universe in other words matter is the basis of all reality everything is comprised of matter and everything can be reduced to matter 
there was a big bang 13.8 billion years ago that started the universe units of matter atoms interacted throughout the universe called chemistry after countless random chemical reactions DNA uh, formed Earth, DNA molecules served as the building blocks of the evolution of life, human beings evolved and developed brains, the brains enabled humans to have minds and awareness, and then an inner experience, and that's consciousness. And so matter is at the beginning, and consciousness is at the end, and that's what scientific materialism is. Um, so what this new-ish movement of scientific thought is saying, no, it's actually the opposite, that the fo foundational layer of the universe is consciousness underneath matter and matter would be like kind of almost like a secondary layer on top of that mm -hmm. um it's primarily based on i mean it, philosophically it's based on the argument around the experience so for example there's this philosopher that we like called rupert spira he's a non-dualist he says quote the materialist perspective is not grounded in experience it requires an abstract line of reasoning that presupposes the existence of a reality outside of consciousness, although nobody has ever experienced this, nor could they ever experience it. So the materialist point of view asserts the reality of that which is never experienced, that matter outside of consciousness, and denies that which alone is always experienced, consciousness itself. So that's the tragedy of the materialist perspective is that um, it's ultimately, I mean, it's almost improvable if you think about it like that, because there's there's no way that we could divorce ourselves from consciousness being tied into uh, making a claim like that is, is one of the early arguments for deconstructing materialism. There's more, um, and I think mainly what, uh, I'm happy to pause here in a second, but mainly what's interesting about this book and about this research is that it's not just one variety or like one discipline. It's it's evidence across a whole series, a series of anomalies across a really wide variety of scientific disciplines. If it was one thing in one area, not so interesting. Um, but if it's taking place, if there's kind of exceptions to the rule in each discipline um, that kind of point to this idea, that's compelling to me and that's worth investigating more thoroughly. Yeah, and I think... Um... Just for me personally, I think like we haven't been able to prove either one yet, right? Right. Uh, and I, I think they're both things that are worth investigating. I just think the consciousness is fundamental is harder to prove. We don't know how to we don't know how to measure that. We don't know how to test mm -hmm. that. We don't we we've collected some observations, I guess I would say, but but I, I, I caution that just because I think the word research gets thrown around way too much, not even just in this field, but just in life in general. Like you hear people be like, oh, I'm gonna do a social experiment or, oh, I'm doing research, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what I see in this space is just an aggregation of observations, which I think mm -hmm. is good, but that's not hypothesis driven experiments. Mm -hmm. I liken it in my field to genomics when there was the boom of genomics, like, oh my gosh, you can sequence everything now. There were people who would just go and just sequence whatever they could. Like, we're going to sequence every bacteria in this group. We're going to sequence all this. We're going to sequence all this. And then it's like, okay, and then what? It's like, well, we're just going to gather all this data, and then we'll, like, we'll figure it out. We'll know some things. And it's like, you need to go in, like, with questions, with hypotheses. When you're just gathering data for data's sake, it doesn't, it doesn't amount to anything. You, the way you, that you gather it can not turn out well either that can kind of bias and precept other things so i think it's important you know when you're going like, like i think it's good that there are some groups that are approaching this more scientifically like the group at uh university of virginia that i've done some some reading in. oh yeah interesting that they then you know dive in and find medical records and find things like this for these these children who uh, purport to have you know past life recall mm -hmm. um which every time I read about that, I think yeah, tens I of birthmark. thousands of accounts. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I have a birthmark right here, like a blonde spot, but you can't see it, but a blonde spot in my head. And I'm always like, what if I was like axed to death in a past life? <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, I think that's another thing that like sometimes, you know, when I, I read <clears> these <throat> things or see these things, that's one of the alarm bells that kind of goes off. I'm like, Oh, I'm like, I don't know if that's yeah. really research. I don't know if I really call that research. Like it's a good start because 
that's kind of where all science starts. You observe an anomaly, an, uh, an anomaly or anecdotal evidence, and then you right. pursue that in a more concentrated path to see if that's true. Yeah, right. and there's a real rigor to the design of the experiment as well. I mean, I think, in, right. you know, one thing I've been doing a lot of research on lately is mindfulness and meditation research. Um, we're kind of trying to cite more studies about it. I, that's a kind of another conversation topic, but just as an example, there's a ton of exaggerative claims about meditation practice. There's none of, you know, real grounded scientific benefits. And so I want to be on the side of saying, no, actually, this is <laughs> this is the grounded science of it. Uh, you know, this is how your neural pathways are forming and, you know, mm -hmm. being able to speak to the neurological and physiological implications of meditation as opposed to, um, you know, what some of the marketing guru type people um you know there's a lot of like get enlightened in 30 days people which really annoy me and i think cloud the space right. and uh you know dilute the message and so on so you know coming into being able to speak about these kinds of things with a level of self-awareness and also humility um is is really important um one thing though that i did want to read to you is um i don't know if you know uh, dean radin who's the phd um chief scientist of ions institute of noetic sciences it's the institute founded by astronaut edgar mitchell um he, dean radin talks a lot about six sigma statistical results do you know anything about that as far as like controlled experiment conditions yeah it's um i, I I don't know a ton about it. I've just heard it bandied about. Um, yeah, I know it's it's like a it's like a process improvement thing. So it's coming more from like a business engineering mm. um, background, as far as I understand. Yeah, he says he, he, each of these experiments I think it's covering to be like six six standard deviations, right? Yeah, um, basically, like he's done. Re research studies on remote viewing, telepathy, precognition, psychokinesis, all of these like, uh, you know, questionable things. And he says each of these experiments use protocols that avoided all known design flaws An extensive due diligence of possible design faults has developed after years of intense scrutiny and criticism of these studies leading to bulletproof designs. Each class of experiments has been repeated by a dozen to more than a hundred times by independent investigators at different labs all around the world with each class cumulatively involving hundreds to thousands of participants. So that rigor is key. I mean, I think there needs to be a level of, um, you know, real thoroughness and examining this phenomena. And I'm not an expert enough to be able to comment on it, but I just wanted to <laughs> sprinkle the discussion with the idea mm -hmm. that, you know, there are there are legitimate scientists that are involved in this. And, um, you know, they don't go on the major news networks and they don't get uh, a lot of love in, um, you know, even the most respected scientific journals, although they're getting there. Uh, and Dr. Etzel Cardinia was one that he references all the time who just published in The American Psychologist. So, that, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like back to that idea about science progressing by a series of funerals. Like, like we're yeah. getting there, but there's just so much resistance to, you know, studies around psychokinesis and things like that, that it's just going to take some time. It's going to take some oh, withering down. I think you down. also have a... Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, no. Uh, I think you also have just like a perception problem you know like when we talk about these phenomena these are the yeah. things that like we think of like in comic books like the x-men you know like right. fiction like beyond reality uh and i feel like there's like a social there's a cultural component cultural to the resistance. stigma yeah yeah beyond the fact that it challenges people's entire careers beyond the fact because yeah i feel like a good a truly good scientist would if they like like they they can feel when the winds are blowing when things are shifting and they'll adapt and they'll be ready for what's going to come next they won't put all their eggs in one basket unless they're like further along in their career like younger scientists i feel like they're better at this um mm -hmm. and being ready for like what happens if that paradigm shifts and accepting the truth like my my graduate advisor would always tell me like i can make her beaten beating myself up over experiments i'm like god like i have this hypothesis it's got to be this all the data says it's this but i'm not getting that result and he'd be like aaron trust the biology nature knows what it's doing we're just kind of following the breadcrumbs trying to figure it out like if 
it's saying mm. this, then go with that. Because if you fight it, you know, you can fight it for a while, but you're going to lose eventually. And, mm. uh, and kind of going back to the societal mm. stigma thing, like um, I know we talked about this a little bit, like when Marianne Williamson ran for president, you know, she's like big in the Course of Miracles community. Yeah. And, you know, you had people calling her like the orb queen and stuff like yeah. that. Like, ooh, Absolutely. she's just this loopy spirit. It was fascinating. Ooh. As someone who is a fan of a course, it was very interesting to see how mm. like the larger society responded to her. And like there was there was some very negative articles on like the Daily Beast and like, you know, which I'm not a fan of them. But, you know, there there's there was some critical like this woman's insane crystal lady articles and uh, <laughs> look at this verse that she quotes. And also like she, she even defended a course in one thing where she said like, uh, you can't just pull like what those articles would do. They pull like three lines from a course to be like, look how crazy this is. It's like this book is 1500 pages. <laughs> like It's yeah. making a larger argument that you're just completely removing the larger context from. So I don't yeah. know. Well, mm -hmm. but, and media is really good about sound bites exactly. out of the context yeah. like when we talk about science i kind of alluded to this earlier the way that media conveys and portrays science a lot they have a big problem and i think that's one of the reasons why you mm. know we see a larger distrust yeah. in science that's than a huge part before. of the age of disinfo for sure yeah yeah, yeah. i but I, go ahead sorry yeah i was gonna say i wanted to um add, add some more context i guess this is back to the earlier um like cliff analogy where sometimes I feel like I'm just hovering off the edge of the cliff because I like to look at both sides of it. And like, I've kind of always been this way. I, both my parents are scientists. My um, dad was a chemist for the Austin power plant for like 30 years. My mom uh, was a lab tech in, uh, in the water quality lab. So they like, you know, but I was also raised Christian. So it was, uh, you know, I've always had both elements there. And, and to this day, I enjoy reading both sides. Like, the Mark Gober book where he's, you know, he's collecting, um, you know, studies that, that hint at maybe that consciousness is fundamental. But, um, I also love reading, um, or listening to like, uh, Sean Carroll is like a quantum physicist who's very matter is fundamental. And, um, I'm reading a book right now, uh, called the beginning of infinity by David Deutsch. And he's more on the philosophy of, of math and science side, but, he, but also, uh, um, he's also very much on the, like, matter is fundamental and i just love hearing where everyone's coming from because uh it it um it's fascinating to me but it also maybe i'm like reserving my judgment to see what happens i'm not sure if it's <laughs> if it's good spiritually or not but i i love learning more like i was just recently learning about kind of the the battle within quantum physics right now of like the early um the, the i think they called the copenhagen interpretation was like Max, Max Planck and the guys that were like talking about how, um, you know, it, uh, the, the wave only turns into a particle when you look at it, therefore consciousness is deciding everything. And then now there's like a new right. theory rising up called the mini worlds theory, where it's like, it has nothing to do with consciousness, but all those possibilities are splintering off into multiple universes and that's growing steam now. So, um, I just love hearing. Yeah, the observer effect out. is an oversimplification, as right. Sam and I think an, uh, other kind of secular minded <laughs> scientists will tend to dispel like the Deepak Chopra read on, uh, you know, <laughs> the observer effect means, therefore, that, you know, we're right. projecting and everything. And uh, it's not people quite kind of that. You know? They entangle that with quantum entanglement, right? And and the yeah. observer effect, and they say, oh yeah, that just that proves that like consciousness and that's the force acting underneath it all. And it's like, yeah, uh, yeah, it's again, these are scientific concepts that I think even the people who work on them have to take a long time to be able to wrap yeah. their yeah, brain around. We're still around. understanding it exactly. And maybe we haven't done the best job, or scientists haven't, of breaking it down in a manner that people can better understand. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's yeah, something I'm interesting I wanted to bring up with y'all though too is like. For, for what we're talking about when we say in, in the in terms of like if it's derived from the brain or not like consciousness i think is the word to use but when we're talking about it like as the thing that underlies the universe do you think consciousness is the right word to use because i think of it more of like as like an energy as like a force and i think hmm, that when you use yeah. the word consciousness people can get 
bogged down and stuck on that. It's very difficult to use to find the words to conceptualize because I mean I th I was talking to some spiritually minded friends recently. I just told you this, but I was we were talking about whether or not consciousness is fundamental. You know, standard uh, drinking Modellos by the pool and uh, trying to unravel existence. And uh, you know, the uh, question I got back was, wait, so you think that tree's conscious? So that that chair is conscious and that's not at all what the consciousness fundamental crowd is trying to say it's that everything is this is almost like a projection or connected to this underlying substratum of consciousness underneath all of material phenomena and i, th I think that's a good word substratum implies like subterranean or like foundational um you know underneath this kind of more seeming living dance of separation on top of that unity Fabric. that connects all yeah exactly uh, so that's an important distinction to make as opposed to like wait you think the stapler has a mind and a brain it's like no not quite that it's a little different yeah another thing that kind of came up as i was turning this over my mind is like do you think consciousness whatever you want to call it this energy is conscious then because that almost implies mm. that, like, it's the same as, you know, other divine creator myth things that, you know, that there's some mystic force watching over us and or guiding our lives. Because then that, for me, the next question that follows is, like, why? And, like, why are things like this? Like, if I'm going to be reincarnated as a means to, like, improve myself, why can't I look back on what I've done before? Because wouldn't that help me grow more? Like, what's the point? You know? That's going to be a whole nother episode. That's <laughs> tune in next week. Um, we'll get to the why uh, at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, yeah. but you know, I think it's interesting that that a lot of the things that the quantum physicists like Max Planck, like Heisenberg, like even I mean Einstein was practically a pantheist. Um, you know, a lot of the things that those guys were seeing in their results and and the uncertainty in, in, in their explorations sounds a lot like some ancient philosophy. I mean, I think that's what's pretty compelling to me about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Schrodinger said, quote, there is really no before and after for the mind. There is only now that includes memories and expectations. I believe this strongly suggests the indestructibility of mind. From the womb of Buddhas, the only thing born or destroyed are the illusions conjured by our misunderstanding. Permanence, pleasure, self-existence, and purity are used by people to establish the reality of the mundane world the world of birth and death. Um, Schopenhauer, man is haunted by the incredible delusion that his present birth is his first entrance into life. Uh, you know, philosophers, scientists, and the scriptures are all kind of getting closer in proximity these days, and I can't help but get excited about that. <laughs> Boys? Uh, a witty quote proves nothing. Voltaire. No, I'm just Hi kidding. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I like I, that um, quote, but then again, I also like witty quotes. Witty quotes. So, yeah. <laughs> I like your question, though, Aaron, and it's. I think it's true. I think like uh, the word consciousness um, is probably really difficult for a lot of people, and it just reminds me yeah. of the Tao and how the truth is that you can't put a word to what this thing is. Absolutely. You know? There is. We can't. It's. It's beyond our ability to be able to describe it with the words, the tools that we have, which is language and words. You know. Um, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's something, it's a, it's not something that is easily solved, you know? Um, and I, I think it's true. Putting a word like consciousness on it probably is difficult for a lot of people. I don't really know the, the way around that, uh, besides maybe everyone agreeing that, uh, this thing is really hard to describe, you know? Yeah. To your point, it's like ineffable is like the best word for it. Like the fact that it is not definable and not use you know it's like a negative definition i think like the buddha basically calls enlightenment like the cessation of suffering like there's no way to describe the positive we don't really know the positive but we can describe what it isn't and it and isn't I think, definable uh, yeah and i think one of the right. one of the big things for me on trying to describe it something that was just kind of like popping in my head as you're talking about it um a lot of the world of non-duality which i really i really love and i i just feel aligned to is the idea that you know this is all an illusion it is an illusion of our senses the tools that we have to try and perceive this world 
And I know that when I'm in nature, um, I feel much closer to that thing that the Tao is describing, right? Um, and it's because of I'm surrounded by things that have naturally, uh, you know, come to uh, come to life. They, it's something that I didn't create. It's something that I was a part of. I am a part of. <clears throat> if I'm in an office space, um, I'm surrounded by things that we have. These are materials that we have pulled from the earth to create new things, right? And they're all just variations of of materials that are here that are, are made on uh, from the earth and it's very it increases the illusion because it's like it's getting you farther from uh that thing that the Tao is trying to describe mm. and so i don't know just something that i was i was thinking about it's like um uh that this thing is very difficult to describe and especially in our current world when we are you know kind of i feel just giving more into the illusion you know the more that we give into the illusion the hard the further i feel from it and the further i i feel to feel close to it and to be able to describe it but um you know if i'm in uh uh, and i think everyone would agree with this i mean this is there's a lot of scientific research about this too about just like people feeling closer to themselves in nature you know and so i don't know i don't know where i'm going with this but it, it's things that were kind of coming into mind of like trying to describe this thing that is hard to put a word to you know i'm glad you brought that up because that was kind of where my mind goes then next like i wanted to bring up the question of taking discussion but i'm like yeah, the Taoist in me is like, you're trying to describe an indescribable thing. Mm -hmm. This is a fault of language. Right. But language is the only tool we have to communicate with each other. So that's totally important. Mm -hmm. So Another we're doing the best we can. Right, exactly. <laughs> Another interesting thing you brought up uh, that I think is worth noting is, you know, talking about like the illusion of, of the senses and the illusion of perception. Yeah. You know, your perceptions, your reality. Yeah. I mean, even your most hardcore materialists, scientists would acknowledge and know for a fact that like you know there's uv light that we can't see but there are animals and creatures that can see it there are creatures that can see smell taste hear things that we cannot mm -hmm. and but we know that they're there and we know that our perception of what's actually going on around us is limited mm -hmm. by what we've evolved well you know what was useful for us to be able to know evolutionarily yeah. so yeah i mean even even those folks would agree that like right there are things that like, like we are limited in our perception by what by the faculties that we have and we can see that be altered you know when people take substances and things like that so yeah so and yeah. i'm yeah that's totally spot on i'm i am of the belief i've always felt that uh this thing that the Tao is describing um is just simply something that we're not able to measure at this point in time that just kind of, and I don't know if we ever will be able to and I don't even know if that's the goal either mm -hmm. I know that when I put my energy there I feel uh closer to myself I feel more love and more compassion and so that's where I go plain and simple I don't necessarily need to describe it or you know uh understand it fully um I just know that it makes me feel good and so I go that way you know and um and yeah I've always felt like uh, same thing with like gravity. Gravity is not something that we can see or feel or touch, you know, and it's something in the electromagnetic field, something that we can't perceive necessarily, but through, you know, a, after thousands of years, we have uh, discovered it. Um, it's right. something that we know exists, but we can't feel or touch it. Just that right there the idea that there are fields that we can't perceive but we know they are there that to me just like just like blows the whole thing open it's just like okay then we don't know anything you know and and to discount anything is seems uh premature you know because there's obviously so much out there that we can't touch or feel or see and so just the limitation of our perception and so that for me is like i'm a yes man to all of it I'm just like, yes, like that, who, like, how, how do we know? We don't know, you know, so I'm just going to follow what makes me feel happy inside. Right. And I think well that said. that's the way I try and live too, is like being a, a practical spiritual practitioner, right? Like totally. We can't know the answers to these things. We might never know the answers to these things. So Maybe use we're not it. supposed to. Right. And yeah, like, like there's an argument to be that, that is made about, you know, the existence of God that like you could never prove the existence of God if there is a God. 
because if there is a god and it's it can control everything it could just manipulate things that you'd never find it right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which always i remember reading that when i was younger and i was like that's like a total like head trip mm -hmm. like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but um but yeah i think you know y'all have talked about this on the show before you know that like jesus didn't show up and said what's up i'm god and so are you see ya and then leave <laughs> like he stayed around and did things as many of these other spiritual teachers have and I, you know i think if if you're just trying to do this to improve yourself that's ultimately a, a narcissistic endeavor like as bob and i used to say at think and drink you're you're trying to get mountain woke you just go climb the mountain and sit on top and meditate and reach nirvana <laughs> see you later everybody like mm -hmm. i think that there is something to be said for using these these ideas and these practices to then improve the lives of everyone around you improve society and yeah and and as y'all said before meeting consciousness where it is right like you have to understand not everyone's on the same path not everyone's interested in the same stuff not everyone's on the same level and that's okay like you need to reach down you need to help everybody else it doesn't mean you're any better than them totally mm -hmm. which absolutely yeah, yeah and i, I think like... the kind of oh, go ahead go ahead scott I'll make a conclusive point before I okay. give Aaron the yeah. next question. Well, yeah, I was gonna say one of my one of my like issues with it is when people try to uh, like prove their faith or prove that it's correct. It gets back to this like wanting to win the argument more than anything, and like it doesn't help either situation. It doesn't help you prove anything, and it doesn't help your faith because it just makes it weaker because it's trying to rely on something else that it shouldn't. And I was like trying to. Uh, like the last this week, I've been trying to like conceptualize like my relationship to like science and, and faith in these things. And um, I guess the metaphor that came up was like um, I was imagining like like a, you know, a blank, empty room. It's and say that's like the whole universe. And and science, um, when it makes these advancements and discovers things, it's like a it's like a statue. And as more statues arrive, um, you notice more you, you notice the negative space that it leaves in its place or that's around it and i'm and love i'm fascinated that. for two reasons that are entirely different we love i love the statues i love the progress and like what it teaches us but i'm also fascinated by what is left remaining and what, uh what it reveals as kind of the relief of what we haven't learned and like i try mm -hmm. to keep those things separate um because i know they're different things like and, and i'm gonna try to blend proof and faith together because their madness lies in my opinion <laughs> so <laughs> yeah that's uh yeah, that's beautiful yeah. Yeah, that's the cosmic mystery yeah i i mean i think this this metaphysical speculation is useful in that it allows us to have that sense of openness and that sense of like awareness about what we don't know and that uncertainty that can ideally open us into an experience and i think to ryan's point about like how nature is grounding for him. I mean, I think a lot of advancements in spirituality don't come from intellectual speculation. They come from experiential, uh, you know, phenomena. They come from, from going through and enduring something in a positive way. And what the intellectual side of, you know, all this investigation can do is open us up to be able to receive that and open us up to, you know, that larger sense of understanding that I think to your point, Aaron, will, you know, allow us to spread it and allow us to live our lives in a way that is helpful and beneficial with others. Like when, when you get in, when you get a taste of the oneness, you see other people as one and you see other people in, in other beings as a part of your own collective experience and, and collective understanding. So um, that's my attempt to tie up everything that you guys are talking about into a <laughs> definitive uh, in point here, because I, fi I find a lot of value in a lot of uh, those kinds of explorations, despite not having answers and despite not having like conclusive uh, resolutions. Ideally, that gets us to a place to be able to improve ourselves and, and to, you know, have that experience that can be really positive. Yeah. And I think kind of to your point, you know, as rational as I am and as I like evidence and nice tight stories and logic, I'm human as we all are. Okay. And experience will always, you know, affect the way we see things, the way we think things. And I have had experiences in my life that kind of lead me, you know, to put more credence in this spiritual path maybe than other people. Like I've dreamed things before that have then happened. 
I don't know how to explain yeah. that. There are scientific There's attempts. no coming back from enough of those. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are scientific attempts to explain that, that, you know, I don't know enough to know how accurate they are or not, but, like, I've had experiences with ghosts that I cannot explain. I was actually talking to my dad when I was just back in town. We were talking about this one time there was a fire at my mom's house, and he lived, like, a mile or so away. And I had forgotten this, but he reminded me he was driving to work and he saw a fire truck. And for whatever reason, he was like, the boys and their mom are in trouble. That fire truck's going to their house. I need to follow it. And he turned and followed the fire truck. And sure enough, it pulled up to our house and he wow. pulled up right behind it. And he was like, and I was like, how did you know? He's like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how I knew. I just saw that fire truck and somehow I knew I needed to follow it and go to y'all that it was wow. going to y'all's house. And I was like, that's, that's so incredible. It's crazy, you know. Like, <laughs> um, that's because the chemicals in his brain fired in right. one area, <laughs> right? Um, but no. I, I always um, see myself though as like, uh, I'm almost like like I need like a Doctor Strange moment, you know? Like I still like I'm I'm <laughs> still too afraid to jump off the cliff unless someone were to like hit me on the head and send me hurtling through like dimensions, and I'd be like, all right, cool. I'm jump off the cliff with us next decade that should be the tagline <laughs> of the viewer house show jump yeah. off the cliff with us and die because um, we the, the, answer, water, the water is great that's the answer to the question beware how we'll jump off the cliff and you'll get there. aaron what are uh what are some of your favorite books that have influenced you profoundly um from popular to obscure uh so mystic christ yeah obviously that's one uh I pulled some off my bookshelf. Dao De Ching. Ooh, that's, Love it. That was probably the next big step. I read that when I was a freshman in college, and it just, like, blew my mind wide open. Expressed all these things that I had always kind of thought yeah. and felt. Um, another interesting one about scientific uh, misinformation is Merchants of Doubt, if you ever read this book. Mm, no. And there's kind of a companion. I this need one's to. more sci So this is very based evidence history uh it's about how a handful of scientists who were bad actors obscured the truth on things like tobacco holes in the ozone mm. uh, the ongoing battle on climate change but i mean yeah and basically you know people knew tobacco was bad 50 yeah. years probably before it was actually regulations started to come down on it because they were able to obfuscate the truth and dance around it um so that's one that's really good to me and then this one is a kind of like a sci-fi sort of novelization of the ideas in there called the collapse of Western civilization. Hmm. So it's a view on from 400 years in the future of this group of like scientists in China talking about why Western civilization collapsed because they didn't deal with climate change. And it's really interesting. Hmm. Um, awesome. Good old stoicism. Idiocracy vibe. Some, yeah, exactly. I love me some meditations. Marcus Aurelius. This yes, is another great nice. stoic book. Um, and then the last one I wanted to bring up: Have y'all ever read any Spinoza? No, uh, I'm a little bit familiar with him, but I need to be more. So, he was like the first pantheist scientist kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Spinoza was like a Western non-dualist yeah. who had never read anything about any of that sort of philosophy. No, he he had no knowledge of Hindu philosophy and traditions, Eastern philosophy. But it's it's really interesting. So I have some great uh, some quotes from him. Like he believed that God is quote the sum of the natural and physical laws of the universe, and certainly not an individual entity or creator. End quote. Uh, Spinoza attempts to prove that God is just the substance of the universe by first stating that substances do not share attributes or essences, and then demonstrating that God is a quote substance end quote with an infinite number of attributes. Thus, the attributes possessed by any other substances must also be possessed by God. Therefore, God is just the sum of all the substances in the universe. God is the only substance in the universe, and everything is a part of God. Quote, whatever is, is in God. And nothing can be or be conceived without God. End quote. And the person who wrote this says the concept of God is, this concept of God is very similar to Advaita Vedanta of Hinduism. <laughs> And like there's multiple other analysis of him that are basically like he's like saying what the you know it's Vedanta philosophy and he had no yeah. idea. Um, yeah, so he was huge for early kind of scientists and early philosophers. Uh, what was he four or five hundred years? He was early. I mean, he was pre Enlightenment yeah, he was era. Like the, talking about I want to say 1600s. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, that is early for a Westerner so, to be saying stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, that God is yeah. the accumulation so he, of substances and physical chemicals. Yeah, yeah, All and like, and I mean, and he was, by his peers was very, very lauded by his peers. Like Hegel said, like he said, the fact that is that Spinoza made a testing point in modern philosophy, so that it may really be said you're either a Spinozist or not a philosopher at all. Mm. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, so. he was also a lens and, and he maker. Had this notion. Like he had a, his philosophy was a yeah. side gig, so that inspires me. Hmm. As a career, philosophy doesn't pay the day job. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't <laughs> even pay Spinoza's bills. bills. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, um, those quotes from him are amazing. Thanks for sharing. Sorry, those yeah, I didn't. Uh, I interrupted you. With that, my bad. Those are great. No, uh, he he. Yeah, I, I've got a few more, but like he was very into like intuition and intuitive knowledge, which I know. We talk about non-dualism there's like the rational mind and the intuitive mind and finding the balance between the two and so yeah th this is i'll just read one more he said uh there is as i shall show in what follows another third kind which we shall call intuitive knowledge and this kind of knowing proceeds from an adequate idea of certain attributes of god to the adequate knowledge of the essence of things so he was all down with this idea of like intuitive mind rational mind and that they're both valuable trying to balance the two you know, hmm. almost like 400 years ago. That's so, beautiful. Wow. Thanks so much he, for he sharing. Just, yeah, we'll link all I don't these. know. I, I can't remember how I came across him, but when I did, I was just like, wow, this dude is like, he's saying the stuff. He's an Eastern yeah. Western philosopher, you know, like yeah. without knowing it, which is incredible right. to me that he found the same path without, without anyone leading him there. Right. It's amazing. That's so cool. yeah. Can't believe I haven't he's a good one. read his stuff yet. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing, too, is, like, these other philosophers, like, you know, reference him and talk about how, you know, he was a monumental figure. But I feel like when you talk about names in contemporary philosophy, he never comes up. He's very yeah. slept on. So cool. Thanks for sharing. Those are really great. And, um, of course. Yeah, really enjoyed the conversation, man. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. For, Good to talk with you all. Oh, thanks for speculating last, with us. One last thing. Don't cremate yourselves. It's bad for the environment. Uh, really? <laughs> it releases greenhouse gases. It releases toxic gases. Don't cremate yourselves. Oh, wow. Just rot? Should your body you just can, rot? They, the they have aqua, like water cremation now. It's like a mm. hydraulic method that creates less or Yeah, just rot in the ground. I don't think it, many people in the history. You Will know, do. Like, mo most creatures didn't die in a burning <laughs> forest, right? Or in an incinerator. So mm -hmm. don't. Yeah. It's good I also thought it was funny. As that, long as we can know, still go into the tree. Right. <laughs> well, that, that was the thing that made me laugh, too. I'm like, you know, like, my body is just a vessel. I'm not my body. But I want my body in the tree, though. <laughs> Better be in a tree. <laughs> I just want to the forest. Just, whatever the best environmental impact, that's all I'm, you know, because it's like, I'm just trying to help out everyone else is still behind. So that's right. good to know that cremation is, is like has a very bad CO2 emission factor. I think they think it's like 500 pounds of CO2 when you burn your body. Whoa. So yeah. So don't burn your body. Being in a tree is cool. And <laughs> defeat your planets. That's all I have. <laughs> yeah, yes, defeat, defeat your planets. planets. I got to get, I got to get me one of those shirts, man. Yeah, man. Well, my body will just rot. I'll transcend. But thank you so much there for that. Go. <laughs> Dr. Aaron Carrado, it's been a pleasure. Thank Appreciate you so you. much. Yeah, good to see you, man. Come back Great on talk. our show in the future. I'm always, I'm down anytime. Just give me a call. Thanks, brother. <laughs> Thanks, Bye. Aaron. <laughs>